season 11 of Doctor Who has certainly brought with it a ton of changes, even for a show known for rebooting itself every few years. And many of these changes, which are epitomized by the series' first female version of the Doctor stepping into the TARDIS and a new showrunner Chris Chibnall taking over the show, have divided the Doctor Who fan community more than the debate over whether the second Doctor's hair makes him look more like a beetle or Mo from the Three Stooges. Yet, is the vitriol leveled at the newest Doctor just a reflection of the ongoing cultural crisis in the United States and Britain? Or are there valid criticisms to be leveled at Chibnall and Whitaker's take on the time-traveling alien? In other words, has this been one of the best seasons of Doctor Who, or one of the worst? Let's dive in, because it's time to nerd out. There have been several common points of contention between fans of Doctor Who that have caused controversy this season. Ever since the announcement that the latest incarnation of the 50-year-old British TV icon The Doctor was to be played by a woman for the very first time, the internet has been set ablaze. And I mean ablaze. Cries of hashtag not my doctor and the doctor's a time lord, not a time lady were constantly bandied about. Because gender titles of a fictional made-up alien race created in the 1960s are really important to respect. But a female Doctor hasn't been the only controversial change this season. Fans have also been divided about how Doctor Who has seemingly decided to drop its focus on a dense mythology in favor of focusing on issues of social justice. From Daleks to Cybermen to Time Wars to wibbly-wobbly timey-wimey storylines, Doctor Who has become notorious for building a complex and layered mythology spanning decades of storylines. And that became most prominent under the show's previous showrunner, Stephen Moffat. Moffat, who was a fan of Doctor Who since his own personal childhood, was known for weaving in narratives trying to tie up Doctor Who's past and future. In fact, at one point in Moffat's run, it felt like the Doctor had to time travel back into his own past or meet another version of themselves at least every other episode. Yet, under Chibnall and Jodie Whittaker, the 13th Doctor's storylines have mostly dropped any major focus on the Doctor's layers of canon, instead drawing on a different Doctor Who tradition, social justice and educational programming. One of the initial intentions of Doctor Who during its earliest years was to switch between high-concept future storylines to teach kids about science and stories set in the past to teach children about history. Think of the Doctor as a Miss Frizzle type from Magic School Bus. Actually, now that I think about it, I wonder if Miss Frizzle wasn't a Time Lord. Wait, is that already a fan theory? Dang, internet, you think of everything. And that's not always a good thing. Chibnall apparently wished to revive this tradition, especially when it came to historical education, and those episodes haven't shied away from showing the darker aspects of history. The episode Rosa sent the Doctor and her companions back to the segregated South of the 1950s to stop a white supremacist from the 51st century from stopping the civil rights movement by trying to prevent Rosa Parks' historical refusal to give up a bus seat to a white passenger. Yet despite the crazy sci-fi concept, the episode showcased the South's ingrained racial prejudice being directed a companions Yaz and Ryan, who are both people of color. In yet another episode, Yaz went back in time to view her family's history during the partition of India. And that storyline featured an amazing twist that the real monsters weren't the typical alien of the week, but instead the bigotry and hatred directed towards Muslims during that era. In yet another episode, when the Doctor visits 17th century England, she finds herself sidelined by her gender in a situation where she would normally be given much more credence had she been still perceived as a boy. So the series has definitely had a much denser focus on education and history historical storytelling, and social justice themes. However, a lot of these seeming issues with Doctor Who this season aren't necessarily good or bad, but simply come down to preference. A focus on mythology is just as valid a storytelling pursuit as focusing on social justice. Having a female lead is just as okay as having a male lead, and it's okay to prefer a dense mythology or male leads over social justice and a female lead as long as your intentions are pure. Yet the issues and the controversy within the Doctor Who community surrounding these creations decisions stem not from preference, but the perceived political intentions. As Screen Rant writer Thomas Bacon pointed out, the potential casting of a female doctor has been bandied about since former doctor Tom Baker made a joke about it way back in the 1980s. Yet making the doctor a woman has always been looked at by fans as a political act rather than a creative choice. Even Stephen Moffat felt this way. When he talked about casting another male doctor over a female doctor when he cast Peter Capaldi, he said, quote, this isn't a show exclusively for progressive liberals. This is also for people who voted Brexit. That's not me politically at all, but we have to keep everyone on board. Notice how he assumes that only progressive liberals would want a female doctor 
and that casting a woman would somehow ostracize conservative fans, as if conservatives would somehow see the simple casting of a woman to be an attack against their political ideology. Even further, Chibnall has also faced criticism of having a political agenda because of the casting of the Doctor's companions. While certainly not unprecedented in Doctor Who's history, this season's choice to have three different companions for the Doctor is certainly uncommon with the Doctor typically only having one or two companions in its modern incarnation. These companions have been a diverse group of humans, with a past middle-aged Graham, a black man with dysphraxia in Ryan, and an Indian woman in Yaz. These castings, coupled with the Doctor being a woman, have led to some fans to complain of Chibnall forcing diversity down their throats in an attempt to be politically correct. And this perceived politiz politicization? Politiz politi politicization. Politi Political, politicalization. That's about as close as I'm going to get with that word. Extends to this season's themes of social justice and historical settings. But it's not as if the show is lying or making stuff up when it talks about the racism of the segregated South, the Islamophobia of India, or the sexism of 17th century England. But the very fact that the show chooses to address these topics brings up ire, mostly because sexism, racism, and hatred are still issues that are sadly at the forefront of our political conversation today. However, I would argue that none of these topics should be considered inherently political. Now, certainly, Chibnall has showcased overt left-leaning politics, such as his usage of a Trump-like figure in the episode Arachnids in the UK as the episode's villains. You know, besides the giant spiders. Because when I think in-depth political discourse, I think giant spiders. But Doctor Who has always been a left-leaning show. As Screen Rant again pointed out, quote, Fourth Doctor Adventure The Sunmakers, for example, was a heavy critique of former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's taxation and privatization policies. The Doctor won by inspiring a popular revolt after quoting Karl Marx. And this left-leaning storytelling has been seen in many episodes before Chibnall took over. And on top of that, like I said, diversity shouldn't be viewed as an inherently political act. Just because women, LGBT people, non-secular people, or POC appear in your favorite media doesn't mean that there's an agenda. We exist, and we deserve to be in stories. And diversity has by no means been exclusive to this season of Doctor Who. For example, under Moffat, the show included a lesbian woman of color as a companion for an entire season. Yet the inclusion of diversity tends to come from left-leaning organizations and media because sadly conservative media continually desires to center straight white cisgender secular men. And that's not to say I hate straight white cisgender secular men, just that that happens to be the identity most often shown. I also don't want to make it seem like these criticisms have only come from the conservatives, however. Even some left-leaning fans seem put off by the idea of forced diversity, arguing that it leads to storytelling that feels like rhetoric rather than cohesive stories. And certainly, that balance between salient allegory and overt political rhetoric can be a fine line. But I'd argue that Doctor Who has balanced this pretty, to paraphrase another Doctor, fantastically. Fantastic. The season's two most politically minded episodes, Rosa and the Demons of Punjab, work precisely because they subvert Doctor Who's tendency to focus on science fiction storylines, and instead surprise us when we see an emotional and very human core to the stories. I mean, for me personally, I was left sobbing at the end of Demons of Punjab, as I watched a brother murdered because his younger sibling just couldn't see past his prejudice. And this is just conjecture, but I'd argue that perhaps one issue is that some people are unable to reconcile the Doctor Who of the past with the Who of today. The character of the Doctor has always been a bit of a power fantasy. We want to see ourselves as the Doctor, someone who knows what's best in every situation and easily takes control, no matter what era they happen to be in. This mirrors a typical white savior cinematic trope, where a white male protagonist rescues characters of color and other minority groups from their plight and learn something about themselves in the process, typically some form of morality. Think about Dances with Wolves or To Kill a Mockingbird. And the white savior story fits into the idea of good storytelling because it fits perfectly within cinematic structure. Without going too deep, we have an act one where we see someone living without oppression, the white savior, and that's our status quo. In act two, the person living without oppression learns about oppression and how it works. And in act three, they take this newfound knowledge and their knowledge of what it's supposed to be like to fight back against the oppression, creating a new status quo. So in that, we have a standard character arc and a bow-like structure of status quo, not status quo, back to status quo. And that's why there's a reaction against stories that center minority protagonists, even from people who understand that diversity is a good thing. It's because the way so many stories have been written in cinema to this point, and our ideal of what constitutes good story structure, has come off the basis of assuming a non-oppressed protagonist. In Doctor Who, the Doctor is always the person in 
in charge, regardless of gender identity. This works perfectly fine when the doctor was a man, but now that the doctor is a woman, we now have to understand the friction that has been put in place in that inherent social contradiction. So as when a woman who is in charge travels to a point in time where women historically are not allowed to be in charge. The doctor can't always go in and take control anymore because there are people who won't accept her authority simply on the basis of her gender regardless of her qualifications. And this season of Doctor Who has confronted that head on, giving us a variety of diverse leads, not just with the doctor, who challenged this idea. We have Ryan, a black man who wants to be proactive in the segregated South, and also wishes throughout the season that he had a father figure in his life, but he can't control that. We have Yaz, who wants to understand her family history in a world that has tried very hard to erase that history that she seeks to know. And in Graham, we get an older man coming to terms with the fact that he can't bring back his dead wife no matter how hard he wishes to change that, and has to come to terms with it. Graham has to face mortality, and mortality is something that none of us can control, except for maybe the Doctor. This season of Doctor Who has been about protagonists unable to control what they had previously taken for granted, or what others take for granted. Instead, these characters learn to accept what they can and reframe how they see their surrounding world. Ryan, unable to have his biological father in his life, learns to accept Graham as the father figure he always needed. Yaz comes to terms with how her grandmother has chosen to share her family history, even if it means hiding some of the harder and darker, yet still beautiful moments of her story. Graham learns to accept his wife's death and even forgave the man who caused it. And the doctor, unable to control the larger world, instead takes a greater control of her personal life, building a larger chosen family instead of being a lonely madman with a box. So overall, I find many of the controversial criticisms of Doctor Who this season to not have much actual validity. Those who find anger at Doctor Who's changes are just trying to justify their anger with selective facts. They argue that they don't want politics in Doctor Who despite the series' history of political storytelling. They also argue that the show has lost viewers with every episode, which, while technically true, happens every single season of Doctor Who, and ignores the fact that this is still the highest ratings Doctor Who has had in years. And in my favorite attempt, they argue that Chibnall can't come up with a good idea because he won't have a Christmas special this year, which has always been a Doctor Who tradition. But that ignores the fact that he did that because he wanted to have a New Year's special instead. It's all selective facts using a common complaint playbook we see in similar movements against shows like Star Trek Discovery in the comics geek proponents. And it all typically masks sexist, racist, and homophobic viewpoints. Now to be clear, that's not to say that there aren't valid criticisms to be made against this season of Doctor Who. Certainly while the season has had its moments, it's failed in other areas. The Doctor herself hasn't really been challenged on an emotional or personal level by any of the stories, and a lack of a season-long story that has become typical of Who has left the show feeling narratively directionless at times. Yet the distinction between valid and non-valid criticisms lie in that they are actually attempting to address the stories and storytelling that the show actually presents, rather than in arguments of preference or attempts to obfuscate dislike at not being the centered identity in the show anymore. So all that being said, do I think that this is the best or the worst season of Doctor Who? Well, to be honest, I actually think it lands somewhere squarely in the middle. It's by no means the worst Doctor Who has to offer, because that has been... Right. Good. By me. Particularly awful. But neither do I think that this season has reached the narrative highs that previous seasons have hit either. But with the news that Jodie and Chibnall are coming back for at least one more season in 2020, I think this season shows great potential for a bright future, or past, for our favorite time later. That's it for this Nerd Out, but you can find even more episodes where I break down geek topics from a queer perspective by subscribing to my Jesse Gender channel on YouTube or checking out some of my previous episodes over on Pride.com. And stay up to date with me by following me on all the social medias at Jesse Gender. Until next time, you've been nerding out.